uh, to speak to us today. Um, she has uh, impeccable academic credentials, which she asked me to gloss over and to focus on a couple of areas of interest specific specifically that might engage you guys. One is in the areas of telemedicine and telehealth, for which she's doing some projects uh, on asthma management. We'll give you some, uh, some information through the course of her talk. Um, and also on secure texting and patient communication, uh, which they've been utilizing uh, as a way to, to monitor patient progress without the uh, somewhat arduous experience of coming to clinic and going through the process that happens there. Um, so uh, as it is the Valentine's Day version of Internal Medicine Grand Rounds, I asked her to tell me three things that she loves, okay? Uh, so one of those is her husband, three sons. Um, second one she mentioned were some friends, some of which are visiting today, Dr. Gwen Carlton and Chris Cannon from AstraZeneca, and Lori Brooks and Matt Driver. Thank you for joining us. And the third thing that she enjoys, she loves, is playing games, one of which will be a part of today's Grand Rounds experience. So pay close attention, um, and we will welcome her now to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate you. Um, so three things I'm going to do before we get started. First of all, I tend to walk, so I may meet some of you all the way back there, so beware. Uh, the first thing that I do is I always pray before I lecture, so I'm going to pray. If anybody's offended, you may step out for about 10 seconds. The second thing we're going to do is I've got about 100 slides. But we're not going to go through all those slides because we'd be here till 2 o'clock, and neither you nor I want to do that. And the third thing is that we do, I have a game. Four slides have to do with a game, and it is a riddle. It's what am I? So for this riddle, what you need to do is you need to, if you know the answer, and the first correct answer gets a prize. And a piece of that prize are going to be kisses because we're going to kiss asthma goodbye. And so that's going to be part of it. And then there is a little something in there for you that has to do with the riddle. So without further ado, I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just ask that you would bless each person that's here, that you'd give them the tools that they need to be successful in what they do in life. I pray, Lord, that you would give them at least one nugget that comes from this presentation, Lord, that they can take back to their homes or to their patients. And I also pray, Lord, that you will provide immeasurably more than what they can ask or imagine. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, thank you for that. Um, can you still hear me okay? Can you hear me without it? Okay, Max says no. All right, so I will use it. I just like to have my hands free. Because of all this technology. Evolution of asthma. The reason why I chose this particular title was because 30 years ago, when I was a medical student, I was in a class, and a pulmonologist came in to give a lecture. And he gave a lecture about asthma and said that we have been practicing asthma, treating asthma with the ABCs aminophilin, beta agonists, and corticosteroids. And what we have learned is that it's an immunologic condition. So now, instead of the ABCs, we start with corticosteroids. This was 30 years ago. Now what we're doing in medicine is not unlike what the oncologists are doing with chemotherapy, targeted therapy. And that's exactly what I want you to learn about today so that you have a better understanding of what targeted therapy looks like and how we need to change our thinking about asthma. Mike, what I'm going to ask you to do, if you would advance my slides for me, so I don't have to run up front each time. Thank you. First slide. I have no conflicts. Well, maybe conflicts, but no financial conflicts. <laughs> you can go through the objectives. I have a lot of material to present, so some of these slides you're going to find that I may just point out one or two things on them, but not a lot of things. So what is asthma? So there are thought leaders that believe that asthma is actually multiple diseases under the title of asthma. But I am in the camp of that asthma is a heterogeneous disease with clinical variability. And you're, that's going to become more clear to you. But we know that asthma is typically, the symptoms are cough, wee, shortness of breath, and chest tightness. So that is going to give you a tip off. Also, the symptoms will vary over time, which is also going to be important for you to realize. And then there's going to be some variability in airflow. Next slide, please. The burden of asthma is huge. 
300 million people worldwide have asthma, and that is part of the problem, but $80 billion are spent on asthma every year. And that's where we come in because we can make a difference in that area. The other thing I want you to see is that asthma is the most common cause, the most common cause of work absenteeism and school absenteeism. And then there's this other, com there's this other con um, thought of presenteeism. And presenteeism is when you are working, you are in school, but you're not as productive. So that can be a real problem with presenteeism with people who have asthma. These kids who aren't sleeping through the night, who aren't getting the oxygen they need, people who have sleep apnea that's not being addressed, those are the things that can impact work and school. Next slide, please. This is actually a great graphic and I'm gonna need my pointer for this, but I want you to look at this. This is probably one of the best graphics I have seen regarding mucus. You know, he said to use um, the pointer. So I want you to look at a couple of things. I want you to look at this area right here, the CRTH2. CRTH2 is chemoattractive receptor homologous molecule, which is expressed on Th2 cells. So I want you to look at this. There have been at least, can you see it all right? No, you can't see it at all, can you? There we go. Okay. <laughs> Could you? Let me pull you back. Woo, yes, right there. Exactly. But what I'm trying to do is the pointer. Okay, now you can see it. Okay, there we go. TRTH2, so this actually binds with PD2, which is prostaglandin D2, if you can see that right here. And what's interesting about this CRTH2 is that it is in clinical trials, actually it's being developed, and there's at least 10 different studies that have looked at this. And one of the things that this does is it helps downregulate eosinophils. So you are going to see this. It doesn't have a name yet, but you are going to see more and more of this because when they're developing it, it's in an oral formulation. All of the other biologics are not in an oral formulation. So it may be that the insurance companies are going to require that a patient fail this medication, which isn't, which isn't out yet, but may fail this medication before they are able to get any of the biologics. So you need to be able to recognize what these medicines are even before they are available so you know what to do with them. The literature also shows that they probably are not going to be, this, this drug is probably not going to be as effective as the biologics, but nonetheless, sometimes you have to follow the protocol from the insurance companies. The other thing I want to show you is T-slip, which is thymostromal protein, uh, lymphoprotein, lymphopoietin, excuse me, lymphopoietin, but I am having a hard time finding the pointer. There we go. Here. And can you see where in the cascade this works? So this is in the pipeline. So you are going to be seeing some anti-T-slip at some point in the not too distant future. So what is asthma? Asthma is a disease that is very complex and that you know many of the symptoms that have to go along with it. It is different based on person's response to therapy, also the risk of adverse asthma outcomes and other things. But there is a concept that you may read in the medical literature on phenotypes and endotypes. And those terms are very confusing if you read them in the medical literature because they use them interchangeably. But there actually are very specific d distinctions on what they are. But again, you're going to see it in the medical literature and they may use these terms interchangeably. So I want you to understand what they are. So when it comes to a phenotype, we're talking about an outward manifestation of the condition. When we talk about endotype, we're talking about the pathophysiology of it. So an example of a phenotypic type of asthma is going to be allergic asthma or asthma in obesity. The uh, endotypic type is going to be eosinophilic asthma. And you're going to hear more and more about that. And the reason why it's important to understand the phenotypes and the endotypes is because your treatment may be very dependent on whether it is an eosinophilic type of asthma or asthma during obesity or with obesity. Next slide, please. Um, you know, I took poetic license with this. This um, article was published in last year, in 2018, um, by uh, Scherzer et al. And one of the things that I liked about it is that they describe these different phenotypes. Now, if you follow that green line underneath, you're going to see that it's divided into childhood versus adult. And you're going to also see that it starts with viruses and Th2 high, and I'm going to go over that in a second, AREDS or obesity, neutrophilic, and um, something called asthma, 
COPD overlap syndrome, which I'll go through just briefly. I'm not going to have a chance to go through all of these different phenotypes, endotypes, but I am going to mention a few. Next slide, please. So one of the things, next slide, please. So we're going to talk about viruses and microbes. And I will tell you, I learned lots of stuff in pres preparing for this particular presentation today because you're going to see that the microbes play a huge role in the development of asthma, something that we really don't talk more about. We really need to because there, it does make a big difference. Next slide, please. There we go. So one of the things that has been found is that in infants who are born 120 days before peak RSV season, are more likely to develop asthma and have hospitalizations. When is that? So September, actually August through September, is when if a person births a baby at that time, that those kids, if they develop asthma, are going to have a worsening course of asthma. That can be a problem. So is it going to get to the point where someone who has a high risk of developing asthma is going to have to we're going to tell them not to conceive until 10 months before this date. We don't know that, but that is something to keep in mind. Another thing is damaged epithelial tissue. What does that do to the tissue? We don't think about that, but it allows allergens like trees, grasses, weeds, moles, just my dog, cat, cockroach, to easily get across that barrier. The other thing that viruses do is they cause viral replication. So when that epithelial tissue is affected, that's one of the things that you're going to see. Also, you're going to see an increase in goblet cells. And I didn't point this out on the previous graphic, but goblet cells is where that mucus comes from in the respiratory system. Remember I showed you that graphic that had all that mucus inside? Well, that's part of the reasons why you see much more mucus when someone has a viral infection is because of that epithelial bar barrier being affected. Next slide, please. The point on this particular slide that I want to go over is the hygiene hypothesis. So in 1989 is when the hygiene hypothesis became known. Lots of people think about the hygiene hypothesis as if you live in a hermetically sealed home, if you aren't exposed to bacteria, then you are more likely to develop inflammatory diseases like allergy, asthma, atopic dermatitis, and food allergy. So that definitely can be a problem when it comes to this. The truth is that it is when we talk about allergy and asthma and atopic dermatitis as well as food allergy, we're talking about this shift. TH cell always starts out as a TH0 or a TH naive cell, and it's going to go down at least one of two pathways. And one of those pathways is a TH1 pathway, and the other pathway is a TH2 pathway. Remember that the TH2 pathway is the one that is involved in inflammation. That's the one that gets stimulated, and the result is these inflammatory diseases like allergic rhinitis, asthma, atopic dermatitis, as well as food allergy. So in this case, what happens is if a person doesn't have a lot of that stimulation, from bacteria and other things, there is a shunt from the Th1 pathway to the Th2 pathway. And when you get that shunt in that or a skewing toward the Th2 pathway, what's again result? Inflammatory disease. And so that is, in fact, what the hygiene hypothesis. But in, 2002, in 2012, rather, they renamed it. And I think it's more apt that they rename it because now they're trying to call it microbial deprivation syndrome because those that don't have the microbes are the ones that are more likely to develop this Th2 skewing and have inflammatory disease. Next slide, please. So it really is about the microbes. And what's interesting about this, and there are several, several studies, and child study that was in, in, uh, developed in Canada when they did this study showed that these four bacteria were really important in the gut flora. And if they weren't there, these kids were more likely to have an increased risk of asthma. Uh, I want to make a comment about endotoxin. So endotoxin is part of the microbial cell wall. And the, with the study that actually looked at the hygiene hypothesis, or one of the pivotal trials, uh, they looked at a Swedish family living on a farm. And they found that those people were less like, those kids were less likely to develop asthma. And the reason for that is they identified that they live with their animals. So they live with bacteria. So essentially, their barn is underneath the home, and so they have a lot of close proximity to it. And they found that these kids had a lot of endotoxin. So endotoxin was, in fact, protective when it came to inflammatory diseases. Next slide, please. And here's another study that looked at the microbes again. This is Kalanomaki's study. And what they found was when there was an increase in clostridia, an increase in yeast, and a decrease in those two bacterial organisms, that is what was those, that's one of the things that also increased inflammation. Next slide, please. Uh, the only thing I want to say about this slide, which is really fascinating to me, 
that prenatal and postnatal exposure to antibiotics also affected the inflammatory response. But one of the things they found is C-sections. If someone had a C-section, then they were more likely to actually, it changed the flora by having, this is one of the theories, it changed the flora inside the gut, and therefore those that had C-sections were more likely to have inflammatory diseases like asthma, allergic rhinitis, food allergy, as well as atopic dermatitis. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So the next thing I want to talk about is TH high and TH low cells and eosinophilia. So next slide, please. So if you're reading the literature, you may see this TH2, this TH2 high and TH2 low cells. And so I'm going to explain that to you. And I will tell you that, um, again, the literature is not very forthcoming when, it, when you try and see what is TH1, TH2. And now we've got TH2 high and low cells, which makes the things a little bit confusing. However, one of the important things about determining if someone is TH2 high or TH2 low is it also may affect treatment. And I'm going to show that to you in a second. Next slide, please. This is probably the best graphic I've seen on TH2 high and TH2 low cells. But this is one of the things that I want you to look at. TH2 high tend to have worsening asthma. They also tend to have different biomarkers and different cytokines. But the other thing that you're going to see is they respond appropriately, for the most part, to glucosteroids. What's interesting about that, and they tend to have high eosinophil levels. What is interesting about that is TH2 low Again, still TH2, but TH2 low tend not to be as responsive to, glu to glucocorticoids. So even though it's a TH2 pathway, inflammatory pathway, doesn't respond as well, doesn't respond as well to um, glucocorticoids. The other thing you're going to see is they have less severe asthma. So this is going to be an important concept because if you understand the TH2 high and low, again, you're going to be more likely to select the right medications for your patient. Next slide. This is actually a great graphic. And this one talks about the pathogenesis of allergic asthma. Remember, TH2 usually points to inflammatory diseases. So this slide shows you the allergen coming through the airway. And when we talk about those things, remember that pollen is from trees, grasses, and weeds. Then we have mold spores. And the other thing we have is protein from house dust mite, cockroach, dog, cat, and other furred animals. And you can see from the, air, in the airway, all right, let's see if I can do this now. Aha. So you can see the antigen coming through the airway, and you're going to see that it is going to, to cause stimulation from some of these effector cells. One of the things that I want to point out here is the role of eosinophil. Here is an eosinophil. IL-5, you're going to hear that term frequently, but IL-5 is a very important um, cytokine in this process because IL-5 does four things. IL-5 is important for maturation, proliferation, activation, and survival, survival of the eosinophil. So that is going to be critically important when you look at this. One of the things that you're going to see is that the IL-5 is going to stimulate maturation from the bone marrow. The eosinophils are going to come from the bone marrow into the circulatory system. And what we learned in immunology is that there is this process called sticking or rolling, sticking, and diapedesis. And diapedesis now is known as transmigration. And you can see that transmigration. That's how tish, that's how the circulatory, these ha that's how these different cells get from the circulatory system into the tissue. So you see that right here? Now you can see you have your um, eosinophil. I want you to look at this graphic next to it. And whenever you have B cells you activated, you have to have T cell help. Without T cells, you can't have B cells. So I want you to notice that cytokines, again, get released from that T cell. And it continues to activate that B cell. And all the cytokines are not listed here. But if you remember, and it's important that you know, IL-4 is incredibly important when it comes to IgE. If you don't have IL-4, which causes class switching, you're not going to have IL-4. You're not going to have IgE, rather. And I, the thing I want to point out here is, again, you need to know that these are IgE antibodies that are attached to a mast cell. 
And for any activation to occur, you have to have cross-linking of at least two of those antibodies. If you only have one antibody that's attached, you're not going to have degranulation. And that is what happens with a mast cell. You have degranulation, and then you get the release of these mediators. And those mediators are things like serotonin, platelet activating factor, prostaglandins, leukotrienes. Um, so those are the mediators that get released, and then they go to target organs like your ears, eyes, mouth, and nose, your lungs, and they can cause inflammation. They can cause inflammation and they can cause symptoms of asthma or, again, allergic rhinitis, atopic dermatitis, as well as food allergy. So it's important that you know some of those, um, what's happening. There's also an early and late phase. The early phase, so a person who is out mowing their lawn, for an example, they're there 2 o'clock in the afternoon to 6 o'clock at night, they start developing symptoms. That could be because of that late phase reaction that occurred. Different cytokines and different mediators are involved in that. Next slide, please. Ah! Game time! So we're going to play a game. There are going to be four triggers, and what I need for you to do is if you know the answer, you have to raise your hand and not shout it out because Chris is going to give you the prize for the first correct answer. So as soon as you know, so Chris, you're going to have to watch your audience. So here is the first trigger, not the very first, my slide, the very first of my slide with a trigger on it. Okay, I'm ready. So two million of us sleep with you every night. No guesses yet. Okay. I thrive in humid conditions, especially 65% humidity. Still no. I eat your humans. Okay, Dr. Azar. Close. But we're not allergic to bed bugs, but there is something that we are allergic to in that family. Well, it's not really in that family, but it's similar. I, I didn't see another hand. Maybe this fell all the way in the back, maybe. Dust mites! You're close. So dust mites. I don't survive in hot water, especially temperatures greater than 130 degrees, and I don't like zip-proof covers or pillows. So um, you're going to meet my friend, the dust mite, and I'm going to tell you something about the prize that he got. So he did get kisses because we're kissing asthma goodbye, but the other thing that he got was he got two things. He got a penny, and I will tell you the truth. I cannot confirm or deny this allegation, but a colleague of mine told me that a dust mite can fit in the nostril of Abraham Lincoln's face on a penny. That's why he got the penny. And also, dust mites are not an insect. They're in the arachnid family, so he got a, he got a toy spider as well. Okay, the next one coming up right now. Next one. Oh, there's my dust mite. Ooh, there's a fellow Platts. Oh, here we go. I, well, I just want to mention Platts Mills. He can tell the difference between there are two species, Dermatophrygoides tyrannicinus and Dermatophrygoides ferinii, and he can tell the difference just by looking at the, th the picture. I'm not there yet, but he's in love with dust mites. Next slide, please. So I am attracted to water sources such as leaky faucets and pipes. I enter your home through small openings. Mold, good guess, not quite right. I thrive in houses with open food, open garbage cans, lots of crumbs. Yes, okay, it is. It's cockroaches. So she actually gets a red and a black cockroach. Um, so here's the other thing. Where are you going to find cockroaches? If you don't rinse out your recyclables, they're going to be there. If you have pet bowls, you leave them outside, you may have cockroaches meeting you in the morning, just FYI. Um, and exterminators destroy our families. Next slide, please. 3,000 different species of cockroaches. The ones that we are allergic to are three species, which is Oriental, American, as well as the German cockroach. Now, to give fair balance, whenever you're supposed to give a lecture on medications, you're supposed to give fair balance. So I am going to give fair balance because I cannot stand cockroaches. So that is my, um, that's what it is. But cockroaches do something helpful, which I learned going through this presentation. I intentionally looked it up. Um, they actually, when they're foraging through all the foliage, they actually can help pollinate flowers. The other thing they do is other debris from other insects, they will break it down and create nitrogen, which is helpful for the soil. Who knew? Okay, so that's my issue on cockroaches. Next slide, please. Yes, if you're like me and you don't like cockroaches, here's a solution. I'm not interested in that, although my son did eat a scorpion when he was in China, but that's not a scorpion. That is a cockroach. Next slide, please. So allergen immunotherapy, there are a ton of slides, or a ton of studies rather that have looked at um, allergen immunotherapy for allergic asthma, and it has shown significant improvement in these studies have shown significant improvement in people who have allergic asthma. So again, it's something that you want to look at. I'm not going to go through all these slides because I'm worried about running out of time. 
Oh, I'm at the halfway point. Next slide, please. So I'm going to show you, don't freak out about this graphic. So here's some of the, the data, and this is how allergen immunotherapy, immunotherapy works. Here's the biology of immunotherapy. So if you can see here, we have an, an antigen, an allergen, and here is an IgE antibody, and here is one of the APCs or antigen-presenting cells. This happens to be a dendritic cell. I want you to note something. Here is a Th0 cell, Th1, and Th2 cell. And what happens when you have um, an inflammatory response, you're going to get Ig IL-4, 5, and 13. And three of the major effector cells are going to be mast cells, eosinophils, and B cells. So again, I mentioned to you what happens with these B cells is that you have IL-4, and when you have IL-4, it causes class switching from IgM to IgE, and these are the IgE antibodies. But the other thing that you have is IL-5, IL as I mentioned, the maturation, the proliferation, activation, as well as survival of eosinophils. So when, there's, when you have allergen immunotherapy, which we're giving the person the very thing that they're allergic to, the things that happen are this. You have an increase in your T regulatory cells and IL-10. And IL-10 will downregulate those effector cells. So when you have a decrease in those effector cells, like Th2, for an example, as well as B cells, you're not going to have the effect that you would expect. You're not going to have release or secretion of IL-4, 5, and 13. The other thing that you're going to have is you're going to have class switching now and isotype switching from IgE to IgA and IgG4. So when they've looked at these studies to see if allergen immunotherapy has been effective, this is what they've looked at. They looked at an increase in IgG4 and IgA, and they have the studies that I just presented shortly. I just presented a minute ago, showed that as well, but I didn't go into detail on that. The other thing that you want to see here is IL-10, which I did mention, as well as you're going to have a switch then from IL-10. Instead of having Th2 stimulation, you are going to have Th1 stimulation, and that is going to not allow for allergies to affect the person. Remember that it takes time, or you don't know that, but it does take time for allergen immunotherapy to work. And the other thing that I want to mention is that there are three types of allergen immunotherapy. We're very familiar with allergy shots, which is subcutaneous immunotherapy. That's been around for over 100 years. What we may not be as familiar with is drops. There are drops that have been... Um, I would say um, tried to get people to use them since the 1970s, and those are still not covered by the FDA, not approved by the FDA, therefore they're not covered by insurance, so that can be a problem. And the other thing is another form of SLIT, which is sublingual immunotherapy, and those are the tablets. And those tablets can be very effective. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So here are the different IgA media, or the IgA uh, triggers. Um, so I just want you to be familiar with them. Next slide, please. And then here are some, next slide. So here is another one. What am I? I didn't want you to see all the non-IgE mediated triggers. So I'm the third most common cause of cough. Yes, she's got it. Good. Um, so I can be controlled with medicine, surgery, or lifestyle changes, elevating the head of my bed, decreases symptoms, and I cause night asthma, belching, and heartburn. And a little, um, one of the things that I want you to know as residents is that everybody's lung function drops in the middle of the night between, between the hours of about 12 and 4. So if someone wakes up in the middle of the night between 2 and 4, and usually they say they, they, they cough at night, especially kids, and I'll say, okay, what time are you waking up? Is it between 2 and 4? And they'll go, oh, 3 o'clock in the morning. Yep. That's very suggestive of asthma. We're for reflux, you're going to see the cough much earlier in the evening. Next slide, please. GERD. How does GERD work? How does that affect asthma? Well, you know what? There are lots of theories out there, and I'm not sure anybody knows quite how it works. But one of the thoughts is when the lungs expand, it relaxes that sphincter, that tissue that holds all the gastric contents into the stomach where it should be. So what happens is when that sphincter becomes relaxed, we think that the gastric contents migrate up into the esophagus, and then possibly you'll aspirate it. But that's probably not the big reason. Probably what the reason is, is again, when the lungs expand, you're going to get that release of that sphincter, the gastric contents are going to migrate up into the esophagus. And when that happens over and over again, it denudes the tissue. So the epithelial tissue will be denuded, and then it will expose all these nerve endings. And those nerve endings then will get stimulated, and that it will cause a protective neurologic reflex. And that's probably the more likely reason why people have an asthma exacerbation because of reflux. Next slide, please. So here are the GERD precautions. Next slide, please. 
Ah, here is my last one, am I? I release substances that irritate the moist lining of the airways. I damage respiratory cilia, cause mucus production. Yes, yes, cigarettes. You get a box of Winston's. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, actually, um, cigarette smoke, remember that the side stream smoke is very, very toxic. There are about 6,000 or 699 different carcinogens in environmental tobacco. And so that's one of the things that we can counsel our patients about. What he got was he got a little toy because when someone is doing uh, environmental tobacco cessation, one of the things that they should do is keep something in their mouth so that they don't want to put cigarettes in there. And the other thing they need to do is keep their hands busy. So he got a little puzzle that he has to work with his hands. Next slide, please. There they are, those yummy cigarettes. Next slide, please. Um, and I'm not going to go through these slides. Next slide, please. And next slide, please. Next slide. So I am going to talk just briefly about aspirin exacerbated um, respiratory disease. Next slide, please. Which is also known as Samster's triad. And some of you may have heard of Samster's triad. Seems like they're getting rid of eponyms. They're using other things to describe it, make it more descriptive. So the three things that are involved when it comes to Samster's triad is asthma, sinusitis with nasal polyposis, and aspirin or NSAID sensitivity, as you can see. And one of the things that happens is, remember from the arachidonic acid pathway, you have this 5-lipooxygenase pathway or the cyclooxygenase pathway. And that cyclooxygenase pathway gets inhibited by NSAIDs. So then it shunts to this lipooxygenase pathway, and the end result is going to be leukotrienes, which cause vascular permeability and other problems. So that is how this can affect asthma. Next slide, please. The, one, the two things that I want to point out about that slide is aspirin is, can be curative. So if you do aspirin desensitization, it can be curative. Not aspirin, but aspirin desensitization. Also, there's a study that showed that aspirin desensitization may also prevent regrowth of polyps, which is pretty huge in people who have polypoid disease because it's very difficult to control patients who have nasal polyposis and asthma. Uh, next slide, please. We cannot overemphasize trying to get patients healthy. Next slide, please. Obesity and asthma. Here is just another condition that is affected by obesity. And this is one thing that we need to work really hard at to try and get patients to control their weight. The things that we know about obesity and asthma, it can be they have a more severe type of asthma. It's very difficult to treat. And the other thing that you need to know about obesity and asthma is that they are four to six-fold greater risk of hospitalization. That is incredibly important. The other thing is that inhaled corticosteroids by themselves are frequently not effective. They can be, but they frequently aren't. And um, ICSs plus LABAs also do not be, are not as effective as um, other medications. So we may need to find out what is going to be the very best medicine for obesity. On the other hand, what we need to do is we need to get obesity under control because we know that is part of what we see every day, hypertension, diabetes, and other conditions because of obesity. So I cannot overemphasize this point that we need to get um, obesity under control. And in the kids as well, and that's where it starts, with the family. We need to re-educate them, give them another way of looking at things. Next slide, please. So these are some obesity treatments. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. I'm probably not going to have time to go through occupational, neutrophilic. Um, I'm going to talk just one. Next slide, please. And next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. There we go. Uh, neutrophilic. When we, someone dies of sudden death, frequently they have neutrophils that are found in their BAL, but that's not what I'm talking about. This is a type of asthma, neutrophilic asthma, and it is frequently due, they think it is due to acute infections. The death is frequently due to acute infections. And that's all I want to say about neutrophils, but also IL-17 is involved in it, so it doesn't look like it is the typical uh, cytokines that you would expect to see when it comes to asthma. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And I'm only going to make one comment about this condition. Uh, the GINA guidelines that came out in 2017 showed that these are folks who have, uh, when we talk about the asthma COPD overlap syndrome, the GINA guidelines said we need to get rid of that, that term, get rid of at least syndrome, because asthma is a completely distinct condition from COPD. And so we need to just call it the overlap. So asthma COPD overlap, not a syndrome. Next slide, please. And next slide, please. And next slide, please. 
um, how do we make a diagnosis of asthma? So you want to look at that airflow limitation because, thank you, the airflow limitation because that's going to be very, very important. And, if you, and then you look at the typical characteristics, cough, wee, shortness of breath, chest tightness, two questions that I frequently will ask the patient because you don't want to say, hey, how's your asthma doing? They're going to say, yeah, it's great. But you can't believe everything your patient tells you. So you need to ask specific questions. When you laugh really hard, do you cough? When you're out running, do you ever feel like you, can, you can't go any further because of whatever is going on with you? Um, do you cough or wheeze after you finish exercising? And is there a significant improvement in their bronchodilator? So when you give them a bronchodilator, is there a 12% and 200 milliliter improvement? If there is, then it's very suggestive of asthma. But if you're still having a hard time figuring out whether or not this is asthma because you don't have the benefit of a spirometer, or as we know, 100% of people with mild asthma have normal lung function. So just because the spirometry is normal doesn't rule out asthma. So you need to take a closer look at that. Next slide, please. So if you're trying to decide because you don't have those tools at your disposal, then one of the things you can do is, again, this came from the GINA guidelines. These are, these are um, things that you can look at to determine how likely a person is to have um, asthma. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So again, evolution. So we looked at these um, guidelines. And the first, con they convened, this expert panel was convened in 1989, and uh, then they came out with guidelines in 1991 and 1997, and they focused on classification of severity. But then what happened, they said, okay, so we've got severity down, but what about control? And so then there was an update in 2002, and what that showed was they looked at severity, but then they added control and they added two domains to that. And then in 2007, it was EPR3, which is the most recent guidelines for the EPR. And then in 2017 is when the GINA guidelines came out. And so if you're going to treat asthma patients, you need to be familiar with these guidelines. Next slide, please. The only thing I want to point out about this is I want to show you where impairment and risk is. And if you see this... So this is the severity that you may be familiar with. But here is the impairment component, and here is the risk component. Next slide, please. The thing I want you to see about control is they looked at, when they look at impairment, they look at the ACT, which is the asthma control test. So if you're treating asthma patients, at least you want to do an asthma control test because we do have electronic health records. Every asthma patient has um, an asthma control test performed each and every time they come in. The other thing I want you to look at, because it caused me pause, in the risk category, these exacerbations. If someone is well controlled, they have one exacerbation a year. If they're not well controlled, they have two to three exacerbations a year. And if they're very poorly controlled, they have more than three. And I will tell you, when these guidelines came out in 2007, I said, oh my gosh, I think I have patients that are poorly controlled, even though their lung function may be great, because remember that even if someone has mild asthma, they can still have a potentially life-threatening episode. And so it made me look at that. So I want you, I challenge you to look at your patients and make sure if they're having these exacerbations, you need to look harder for these triggers. It doesn't mean you necessarily need to increase medications. You need to see what's triggering, what's fueling it. And the more you know about the phenotypes and the endotypes, the more likely you are to be able to target in and get the right treatment for that particular patient. Next slide, please. Um, the two things that I wanted to show you here is the written asthma action plan. So again, these are the 2007 guidelines. Oh yeah, that's right. Written asthma plan is incredibly important. Whether you base it on symptoms or peak exploit flow values, it's incredibly important. Um, the other thing that I, I thought was important here is that you want to also look at the exposure and sensitivity to allergens, again, and irritants. Next slide, please. And so again, the GINA guidelines, if you look at the third comment, allergen immunotherapy was considered in the 2007 and the 2017 GINA guidelines. Next slide, please. The comment that I would like to make here is that one of the things that you want to look at is maintaining, again, normal activity levels. So that has to be asked. You need to ask your patients that. Next slide, please, Mike. And again, you want to reduce those exacerbations. But one of the key things you want to know is for any of you that treat children or have children that may have asthma, we know that the better control we have, the less likely they are to inhibit or to impair their lung growth. And some of the parents are worried about inhaled corticosteroids, but if we don't treat them at all, they're going to have impaired lung growth. So that can be a problem as well. So we need to talk to them about the side effects of the medications as well as what happens if you don't treat them. Next slide, please. So now we come to the biologics. It looks like I am missing a couple of slides, but that's okay. Um, Zolaire. So we'll talk about Zolaire first. Next slide, please. So Zolaire has been around for um, since 2003. 
since 2003, and it's the first biologic that was available. And this particular medication will work for allergic asthma. So you have to have an IgE positivity to, usually they say perennial allergens, which is going to be dust mite, for an example. Um, and in 2014, it got approved to treat chronic idiopathic urticaria, which has been a lifesaver for many of this. We don't know exactly why it works, but it does, and it makes a difference with our patients because if you've ever had hives, you know how horrible that itching is because it can make it excruciating. I've had a patient come in and tell me, I want a bullet for my gun because I can't take this anymore. That was before we had Zolaire. But now we have Zolaire. Next slide. Oh, and the other comment that I wanted to make about Zolaire is that there's some studies that suggest it may actually have some antiviral properties as well. And then here is a graphic, again, that shows you where Zolaire um, or this antibody, omalizumab, will bind. Here's omalizumab. And it binds the IgE. So it binds free IgE, so it prevents it from attaching to a high affinity receptor, IgE receptor. Next slide, please. Um, sync air. Sync air is, is um, also known as reslizumab, and this is another biologic that is available. One of the benefits, and I'm just going to go through the positives and the, the, the inconvenience as well as the positive benefits. So sync air is a medication that, again, was approved for the treatment of eosinophilic asthma. Again, those eosinophils. This is an IL-5 blocker, and I'm going to show you that to you in just a second. The beauty of it is with those patients that are obese, this is weight-based. It's the only one that's weight-based. So you determine their dose based on their weight. And again, if you've got patients that are obese, if you've got a patient that's on an, another anti-IL-5 medication and they're not getting the results that you're hoping and you wish that you could increase the dose, that may be a time to change to this particular medicine. However, this is infusion only. So these have to get infused, and that makes it much more inconvenient for people. Next slide, please. So I'm going to show you where a reslizumab and mepolizumab, and mepolizumab is nucala. I'm going to show you where that works. So if you have IL-5, this is an eosinophil, and if you have IL-5, it's going to bind to the receptors, the IL-5 receptor, the alpha and beta IL-5 receptor. However... If you don't have IL-5, like here's what happens with rosizumab and mepolizumab, mepolizumab, is that you have this antibody that is binding to IL-5, and when it binds, then you cannot have binding to the IL-5 receptor on the eosinophil, and then you do not get the signal transduction, and those other mediators are not getting released. So therefore, this medicine will work for eosinophilic asthma or these two medications will work for eosinophilic asthma. And, and honestly, to be completely fair, next slide, please. I don't have anybody on reslizumab at this point, and mainly the reason is because it is difficult to convince people to go and get an infusion when there's other available medicines that you just need a subcutaneous injection. So Nucala is mepolizumab, and they have an, another indication. They have an indication for eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis that some of us docs who have been in practice for a while known as Churg-Strauss, which is um, small to medium-sized blood vessels that are inflamed. So we call that, a, so it's a type of vasculitis. And um, th that's one of the, the um, indications for this particular medication. Again, they have to have an elevated eosinophil count. The next... I, don't have a gra I do have a graphic on uh, mepolizumab, but because reslizumab was so similar, I just used one. The next one is Fizenra, Fizenra or Benralizumab. And again, this is for severe eosinophilic asthma. Here is my typo. This should have been taken out. I believe that eosinophilic granulomatosis, polyangitis, um, we, they will have an indication for this, but they do not at this point, so I apologize for that. It got by me when I was going through my slides. Um, but when they did the studies, they didn't have a specific biomarker. And because they didn't have a specific biomarker, they got it approved without a biomarker. So they didn't need to have a certain eosinophil level. However, lots of the insurance carriers are requiring that they do have, you do have a patient, if they need to be on or if they approve it, they do need to have an elevation in their eosinophils. It also is subcutaneous. And here's part of the reason why... Um, the health insurance companies prefer this medicine to some others because the way it's dosed, it's dosed every four weeks times three doses, and then it's every eight weeks. And that may not seem like a lot, but the patients love it because they're only coming in every two months as opposed to monthly, and the health care providers like it, or not providers, but the health insurance carriers like it because it's less medication. That means less money out of their pocket. Next slide, please. And so this is where benralizumab works. 
And this, again, is a great graphic. This medicine works a little bit differently because it binds on the IL-5 receptor itself. So here's benralizumab. It binds right to that receptor. It doesn't bind to IL-5 like the other ones. Thank you. Um, but the other thing that you're going to see, and this is why I love this graphic, this is an NK cell. And remember I told you that IL-5 are important for eosinophil survival. So what happens is when you don't have IL-5, you can see this NK cell. It is being stimulated, releasing granzymes and perforins, and destroying the eosinophils. And we know that as apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. You may have heard that term before, and that's exactly what's happening here. Next slide, please. Dupixin. This is my last biologic. And Dupixin was originally developed for atopic dermatitis, but down to age 18. And then they got an indication uh, just this last year for asthma as well. So here's one that you have to have eosinophilic asthma. And the beauty of this particular medicine is that if someone has severe atopic dermatitis and they're the appropriate age and they have eosinophilic asthma, you get two birds with one stone. Next slide, please. And one of the things that I want you to see here is IL-4. Again, it's important for class switching from um, your eosinophil, no, 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 not your eosinophil, from IgM to IgE. And if you don't have IL-4, then you cannot have that class switching. So IL-4 is inhibited when it comes to dupixin, as is IL-13. Now, they did studies on IL-4, and they found that they did not get good results. But when they, when they inhibited both IL-4 and IL-13, that's when they found it to be effective. So that is how uh, dupixin works. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. I'm going to let you go through this, but these are some of the NIH guidelines or some of the GINA and the um, ERP, EPR3 guidelines. And one of the two, the two points I want to make here is that if a person, your patient, has more than two births of steroids in a year, they should be seen by a specialist. You can send them to us. The other thing is allergen immunotherapy is also an indication for them to be seen by a specialist. Next slide, please. Oh... My telehealth slide didn't get in there. Okay, so telehealth. I wanted to comment on telehealth, which is what we have employed in our practice. So we have the premier asthma management program in which we do a lot of education with the patients, but then we do telehealth visits. Thank you. We do telehealth visits. So at week two, after they're in the office for week one, they, I have a telehealth visit where we talk about very specific things, like um, have they gotten their medicine? Are there any access to care? Are there problems that they have because they're not getting their medicines? So there are very specific things that are asked because we have four nationally educated um, asthma specialists in our office, certified national sp specialists in our office. So they do the talking of the patients at week four, same thing, we do another telehealth visit, and then week six they're back in the office to see us. So telehealth, and I had two slides, one was a Cochrane analysis, and the other one was Jay Portnoy's studies, and that has shown to be very effective in terms of decreasing hospitalizations, decreasing ER visits, and improving quality of life. So telemedicine is really where it's at these days. And in summary, asthma is a heterogeneous disease with clinical variability. You need to know the different endotypes and phenotypes, because if you do, then you're more likely to be able to effectively treat asthma. Um, and then you need to know those guidelines, because if you don't know the guidelines and you're going off what some of the professors have taught you that may be helpful, but things are changing like crazy. And the last thing that I want to talk about is, or comment on, is that this is the future. The future is now. So 30 years ago, when I look back, I think how far we have come. And we're just still just scratching the surface of immunology. So today, we are looking at personalized precision medicine, but you have to have the knowledge base to be able to implement the things that you need. Thank you for your attention. And you do get kisses for questions. We got three left. You hear of uh, patients who've had asthma as, chi as a child but don't as an adult. Is there some immunologic uh, connection to that? So did you hear the question? Yes, you get some kisses. Um, so the question is, you hear of children that have asthma and then they don't as an adult. So the question is, is that an immunologic issue? Well, yes and no. So if that child had allergic asthma and you effectively treat the allergy, such as with allergen immunotherapy, whether it's slit or skit, then it will helpfully get rid of their asthma. So that has been shown. But the other big thing that we need to know about is that 
Frequently, asthma may go into remission, but the truth is if you follow Martinez's data that was published about 15 years ago, and he looked at these kids that were prone to have asthma, if by the age of six they had asthma, they had permanent asthma. It's incurable, it's, life, it's potentially life-threatening. However, it can go into remission. What happens is 10 years later, 20 years later, even 30 years later, they come back and say, my asthma is bothering me, or they don't recognize it's asthma because they grew out of it. When I first came here, a couple of things I thought were hilarious. When I was on TV, I got these questions, and one person said, I learned that if you have a chihuahua, that the asthma will jump from my child into the chihuahua. That is not true. That's a myth. The other one is if you cut off their hair and you put a lock of hair in a tree, if you stick it in there, when the child grows to be a certain height past that lock of hair, their asthma goes away. Again, not true. Um, so the answer is, is it immunologic? It depends on what the trigger is. So you can actually attenuate disease with, if, you can, if you can get rid of the triggers. And then the other thing is that frequently it's in remission and it will come back, especially with other triggers. You do, mm -hmm. and then what about? So she's a she's a rheumatologist. You're a rheumatologist. Mm -hmm. So she she said that. Are you worried about um, infections? And the answer is yes, you are. And the reason being because anything that can um, affect the immune system can allow for infectious agents to occur. And then she wanted to know about TNF alpha or. So um, for, for other inflammatory conditions, like rheumatoid arthritis and other things, they'll use biologics. And the truth is that I always look it up. So sometimes there, sometimes there are drug-drug interactions, so I look it up because some of those people cannot handle another um, biologic. So I always look it up. So the answer is yes. So uh, at what point in your practice are you, when you're seeing patients, are you doing... Uh, CBC, IgE, or uh, can you comment on when you do different labs for, uh, for patients? What severity or is it right from the beginning? So the question is, when do you get these labs? Because to get an IgE level, and unfortunately, um, it's less expensive to get a CBC than it is to get an eosinophil level by itself. So we get a CBC, and the question is, when do you do that? When do you get a total serum IgE, and when do you get a CBC? So if someone comes in and they've never smoked, and their lung function is moderate or severe, we get it first visit. Because I want to have that in the chart, because what we'll do if someone needs to be on a biologic, we schedule a nurse appointment, so they come in and talk to the nurse about it, so they get all the details before they sign a consent and start the medication. So we do it almost immediately. But if someone is whether or not... For moderate or severe. For moderate or severe. And if someone has mild asthma, but they've had multiple exacerbations, absolutely, I'm going to do it then. So I, I would say that I do it more than not because we want to make sure that we have that data in, the, in our chart. The other thing is that we'll also frequently get an alpha-1 and a trypsin level, um, because I think that's important. And then on kids, and I, have, I was fooled once, but never again, I had a small child who was about six that had ABPA. They had a markedly elevated IgE, and I thought ABPA was more of an adult disease, which it is, but this child had it, and I sent it to Northwestern to make sure that's what it was, and it's sure enough. So um, we'll definitely look at that and get sweat cords as well. PPDs and all those uh, tests before all the biologics? So the question is, do we get PPDs before all those biologics? And truthfully, routinely, we do not. Um, but we definitely need to look at that because of the concern of getting some kind of a mycobacterial infection. But I don't know that there's any. Gwen, can you comment on that? No, uh, there's, there's no requirement for that like there are with the ones used in rheumatoid disease. Right. Thank you for your talk. Uh, what's that? All right, so um, more just a comment. As you said, personalized precision medicine, it seems that the goal is more modulation than elimination of the IL-5 and the eosinophil. And how can we move toward that? I know when the studies with endotoxin and the antibodies that came out, we were eliminating it and the problems we had. So do you see foresee problems if we eliminate IL-5 or the eosinophil? Absolutely. So what's the problem? So what do eosinophils do? The question is, what do we do if we eliminate IL-5 and therefore eosinophils? Who knows? What do eosinophils do? Are they helpful? It's kind of like the cockroach. I'm not a big fan of cockroaches, but cockroaches. So yes, absolutely. So parasitic diseases. So if someone has a parasite, what happens? The eosinophil, which is so cool, 
the eosinophil will actually migrate inside the parasite. And then it will degranulate, if you will, and it will release these toxic granules. And so you probably have heard of major basic protein. That's one of them, EDN, EPO. Those are some of the toxic granules that get out of the, the eosinophil. Then they get into that tissue of the parasite, and poof, the parasite dies. So the same thing can happen, of course, the same thing does happen inside the body. So if eosinophils, if those toxic granules get into the esophagus, then we have eosinophilic esophagitis. If it gets into the lungs, then we have eosinophilic asthma. So absolutely. So if someone has a parasitic infection, if they're traveling in another country and they get a parasite, that would be potentially life-threatening. So absolutely. You can't alter one thing and not expect there to be a downside to it. So I believe that the key is... We need to focus on prevention. And how do we do that? We get that gut flora healthy early on. Maybe we don't do as many C-sections. Sorry, Lena. I know you don't do that, but best gynecologist in town. Um, so the other thing that we have to look at is getting these kids better at an early age, looking at what we can do for the microbiome, and we need to take care of them because if we do great prevention, then what happens is that we may not develop asthma. The PAT study showed that if we had kids that were treated with allergen immunotherapy, 50% of them did not develop asthma. So we need to look at how we prevent the development of asthma so that we don't have to spend a ton of money on biologics and other things. But unfortunately, we live in a society where people eat too much or eat unhealthy things and we're not taking care of our gut and we're doing fast food, those are the things, those are the things that have to change. And that's when we're going to see a huge effect. But insurance companies don't pay for prevention. So unfortunately, the onus is on us to make that change. Does that help answer your question even a little bit? Thank you so much for your attention.